Welcome everyone. Hello, this is Nova. Uh, we're broadcasting live from Boston, Massachusetts to Classroom Across the Country for our first ever geo field trip. Um, so just in a few moments, we're going to turn it over to the Rhea Tar Pits walking. Actual on-site jackhammering going on in LA, uh, and they're going to show you Project 23. This is one of their newest excavation sites, archaeological sites across the country, the La Brea Tar Pits. They're going to tell you all about what's going on there, um, and you'll have time after the presentation to ask any question you want to the staff on site there. Okay, so before we begin, we have a few housekeeping notes about participating in the field trip. If you look in the right-hand corner at the top, you should see a little box that has nine other boxes in it. If you click on that button, you'll resources from Nova and La Brea. Um, Right now, we're giving away free copies of NOVA's Making North America series DVD to the first 25 classrooms who fill out the Google form located in the showcase. So if you want to try that out now, you can. Um, the other button links to our Q&A section. So in using that button, you can click Submit a Question, um, write in your question with your school's name and your state, and we will introduce your question and read them to the La Brea team. Okay. So today we're joined by Laura, who's a paleontologist and staff fossil preparator with the Project 23 excavation site at La Brea. We're also joined by Kelsey, um, who is the school programs coordinator at La Brea, Matt, who's a volunteer at La Brea, and Gary, who's also a paleontologist on site. And if you watched the trailer from our series, Making North America, before you started today, you would have seen Carrie and so now we're going to turn it over to the Brea team. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the La Brea Targets, and more specifically, welcome to Box 14 of Project 23, our current excavation. Uh, before we get into what is going on right here in front of us, uh, I just want to give you guys a little bit of background about this site and what makes us so special here at the Tar Pits. So here at the La Brea Tar Pits, we're an extremely special place. We're really special because the fossils that we find right here teach us what life was like in Los Angeles during the Ice Age. So the period of time that we study here is about 11 to 55,000 years ago. We are one of the world's top Ice Age fossil locations, so we have millions of fossils that we've already discovered, and we have millions more that are still awaiting excavation. We're also, um, as you can hear from the jackhammering going on uh, behind me, and you'll probably be hearing some traffic going by, we're an active paleontological excavation that's going on in the middle of a major city. So that is a really, really unique thing about us. So in short, there's really no place that's quite like the Tar Pits anywhere else on Earth. So why do we have this amazing fossil locality right here in the middle of Los Angeles? So what we have here is it, um, pretty much a perfect storm for fossilization to happen. So because of how the LA Basin formed, we're actually left with this massive deposit of oil that is uh, running underneath most of the city here. And when we have earthquakes, which we have a lot of in Southern California, we're pretty famous for them, that oil can actually seep up to the surface. Uh, quick note, you're going to hear us say oil a lot. You're going to hear us say asphalt a lot. You aren't going to hear us referring to this black sticky stuff as tar. Um, it's actually not tar. Uh, little known fact, tar is a man-made product. So what we have here uh, at the tar pits is actually naturally occurring asphalt. That is what animals got stuck in. It is also what preserves their fossils for thousands of years. Um, so when we think about the Ice Age, um, we think about this kind of frozen wasteland, right, woolly mammoths walking across. That's not really what we had here in Los Angeles. So uh, much like today, it was uh, pretty temperate. So we're all out here in our t-shirts and light sweatshirts in the middle of December. So um, same thing during the Ice Age. It's not super, super cold here. So we actually have this really amazing biodiversity uh, here in LA during the Ice Age. So not just really big animals. So uh, when we think about uh, Ice Age, think about saber-toothed cats, mammoths, giant ground sloths, dire wolves, these megafauna actually are the minority of our collection. Uh, we have about 600 species here on our species list. And what we find uh, mostly is uh, things like invertebrates, plants, reptiles, rodents. So uh, the little guys actually 
And the way that fossils actually, um, the way that animals are getting stuck here is by a process that we call entrapment. So if you picture um, a nice warm day in Ice Age Los Angeles, there's asphalt seeping up from underneath the ground and an unlucky herbivore, so say something like a giant ground slug might wander by because um, it might not see it, it might wander into an asphalt seat, and it might get stuck. So after struggling for a while, this ground sloth would probably um, cry out for help, it would probably be making a lot of noise, and it would attract a lot of predators. So things like saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, giant jaguars, short-faced bears, uh, maybe some mountain lions or coyotes. So these predators would come running in because they really want this really easy meal, and they end up getting stuck too. And it doesn't stop there. So we have smaller animals, the scavengers, that would come in afterward. And after this whole mess was left exposed to the surface for months, only bones would remain, and then the next time it was warm, more asphalt would seep up from underneath the ground and cover those bones, and that is how they get preserved. Um, if you look at the deposit here in front of us, you'll see that it is just this jumbled mess of fossil materials. So that's what we're sorting through. That's why our bones get so jumbled up. Many animals are getting trapped at the same time. And because asphalt is a liquid, the bones are actually getting moved around. So after um, the animals are already covered, the bones continue to move again because of tectonic movements and also because asphalt is a liquid. So they end up at this beautiful jumbled mess that uh, our excavators get to sort through and pull out fossils from. So here at the tar pits, our research and excavation is still continuing. Obviously, we're still excavating. Our museum, um, in addition to being the place where we store and display the fossils, is also an active research site. So we have a working paleontological laboratory inside the museum. We have researchers who visit us from all over the world just to look at our collection because of the quality and the quantity of what we have. So we're a really important site for ongoing research. And the research that we do here, um, it not only helps us understand how this place has changed over thousands of years, it can actually give us insight into environmental changes that are happening today. So we're a really, really amazing, really relevant site. So um, to give us a little bit more information about what's going on inside Project 23, I'm going to turn it over to Laura. All right. And so hi and welcome uh, to Project 23. Uh, specifically right now, we are in box 14 of 23. And uh, fossils from this particular box, I should bring it back to where these boxes are from. Thank you. Uh, so all of this, Project 23, came about in salvage from when our neighbor was building an underground parking garage just next door. And if you dig underground next to one of the largest urban deposits of fossils in the world, surprise, more fossils! Um, but there were so many fossils there within the footprint of the garage that what was actually ended up happening is that they brought in three companies. So the company building the parking garage itself, working with a team of what are known as paleo monitors that are paleontologists specially trained to go before, during, and after the big excavation equipment. And they teamed up with a landscape company that specializes in moving large trees alive by building boxes around the root walls. And we're very lucky that our fossils tend to come in clumps. And so what they were able to do is figure out the edges of those clumps, build boxes around the entire chunks of earth themselves, crane them up and move them over here. And they came over in 23 boxes. So we call it Project 23. It's a very fancy naming scheme. And the boxes range in size from the largest was 123,000 pounds, which is more than my apartment. And uh, the smallest is only 9,000 pounds, only. Um, but the boxes also range in the type of matrix, the dirt that we have to dig in, the ratios of silts and sands and clays and asphalt and fossils, completely different from not just box to box, but sometimes within the box, as well as how many fossils there are. Some of the boxes, uh, like box 14, has already produced thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, when we count every lizard scale. Uh, of fossils from just this one box in particular, where some of the other boxes only oh, 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 oh. Yes. Okay. Uh, while some of the boxes only had hundreds or thousands of fossils in them. So every box takes a different amount of time to work on, and uh, we use volunteers to do most of our excavation. 
you're looking at half of the staff right now. Everybody else is volunteer. We could not do what we do without them. So if any of you live nearby when you're 16, you should come help me play things. Um, but hopefully we will not currently be working in box 14 by then. Um, box 14 started out as one of the larger of our boxes. It was about 86,000 pounds when we first started digging. So we're in the bottom about third to quarter of the box. And uh, as you can see, fossils have narrowed to the center of the deposit because most of our fossils tend to be in roughly conical shapes. And, uh, but we've been pulling fossils out of this box, again, for many feet above my head. And a lot of the fossils out of this box have been coming out with uh, carbon-14 dating between about 38 to 46,000 years old. And we have many of our classic individuals. We have at least seven adult direwolves. We've got a saber-toothed cat, adult. Uh, we've got coyotes. We've got bison, horses, camels a baby mastodon, um, we have a giant brown sloth, we have small things uh, like turtles and plants and lizards and squirrels and rabbits and lots and lots of branches and especially a lot of birds in this box. This box has so many birds, even for us, which we're one of the number, you know, one of the top bird fossil sites in the world, so we're very spoiled with that. Um, but just this box, so a lot of what you're seeing right now that happens to be currently exposed, a lot of the things sticking up right now are dire wolf, coyote, birds, and sticks. Um, some of the fossils I brought to share with you guys that have come out of box 14 recently. Uh, so I brought just the front end because it's easier for me to hold. Uh, this one is an adult dire wolf skull. I'm holding it upside down to protect the teeth. But again, so this is the skull. Um, so this would be the nose. And these are the canine teeth. And these ones back here are the teeth farther back. And the back end of this skull would go to about here. I left that in separate bag because it's broken. But luckily, it's a clean break. So hopefully, in the laboratory, they'll be able to put those pieces back together eventually. But also keep in mind, I'm not just holding up one fossil right now. All of this dirt that's packed in and around this skull is full of microfossils. Those smaller animals, the lizard scales, the mouse toes, the insect legs, the seed pods, the things that in the grand scheme of things give us a better idea of both what it was like here in Hancock Park tens of thousands of years ago at a specific time, and also helps us study better climate change through time. Um, but because it's harder for me to show something that's a speck, I brought out a bigger fossil for you guys. Um, and then some of the other things that I brought out, because um, I think they're cute. So this one is a tibia which is a shin bone, and this is from a direwolf puppy. So again, uh, the growth plates on both ends have not yet attached yet, because like you and me, it's a mammal, and that's how we do our growing, is that we have our ends more adult size and adult shape, so we can still do all of our bending that we need our joints to do, um, and then we grow from the middle part out and then eventually attach those ends. So again, we're not just getting adult animals, we're getting young animals, and we get very excited about those and part, part of that reason is that I'm more likely to be able to say this bone might go with another bone than I would with an adult fossil. Because with many of those adult fossils, once they've finished those growth stages, it's very hard to tell different individuals apart, especially with a more common animal like a dire wolf. Again, just in the scramble alone, I know that I have at least seven adult dire wolves. Um, but I'm hoping that maybe I only have one dire wolf puppy of this specific age. So hopefully I can figure out what happened to this animal, what's called taphonomy, which is the study of what happened to it between it dying and us finding it. Because again, we just find scrambles of thousands of fossils. And so we get extra excited about the young individuals for that reason, as well as things that have some kind of injury or disease that shows up on the fossils, or things that are very rare. Like for example, that baby mastodon that's in this box, we can be pretty confident because they are so relatively rare for us that that's probably all one individual. And he's young, which helps again. And then, uh, so I wanted to bring out a toe, but again, many of them are this small. So I kidnapped a toe from this box that's from a much larger animal. Again, this is a little bit bigger than your toes, probably. I would hope. Um, this one is from an adult bison. And I'm very excited about this particular adult bison, because again, normally bison is our most common large animal that we find, or large herbivore, thank you, uh, that we find here at the uh, La Brea Tar Pits. But in this particular box, so far, fingers crossed, 
it looks like we don't have any repeats and it looks like it might all be one bison through the scramble. So again, just like those young animals, sometimes we do get a more common animals, but so few of them with no repeats that we can be more sure that it might be from one individual. And again, so we can learn more about that particular animal. And we like to joke that it's like taking a selfie through time. Um, so that's some of our fossils here. So uh, do we need to keep talking? All right, so now it is time. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was wonderful. Now it's time to transition to some of our school questions. Yeah, thank you, Libre team. Um, first, we have Mr. Dempsey's ninth and 10th grade biology class joining us from Acton Boxborough Regional High School in Acton, MA. Um, hello. Hi. Hi, Mr. Dempsey's class. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Hi, can you hear us? Yes, we can. Oh, there's a little bit of an echo. Exit. One sec, sorry. There you go. Okay, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, hi. Um, our question is, why did the tar pits conserve the skeletons so much better than other fossil sites? Yeah, go ahead. All right, I want to talk over people. Uh, but so yes, one of the reasons why our fossils are in such great shape is that it's a, it's a more uncommon style of fossilization. So fossilization has many different kinds. The most common that you hear about is permineralization, where uh, the original minerals of the fossils, generally by groundwater moving through them, are replaced by other minerals, and that fossil gets chemically turned into rock. Unlike that, our fossils in general are preserved in that crude oil mixed into the dirt with it. And again, so the oil gets into all the tiny little spaces. So if you notice our fossils of that beautiful La Brea Brown patina, um, part of that is because the oil has gotten into all the tiny little spaces. And since oil and water are not so big on mixing, it actually prevents both that water coming through and chemically turning into rock or just it normally decaying like it normally would. So that asphalt both protects it through the tens of thousands of years and then continues to preserve it into our collection, which is why if you see fossils from here, they tend to all be that brown color. Thank you, Laura. Um, our next question comes from Mrs. Biernath's eighth grade class from St. Mary's Visitation School in Elm Grove, Wisconsin. Hi, we can hear you. Oh, make sure you unmute yourself. We can hear you. Uh, our, our question is, like, how did the tar form? How did the tar form? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, so the way that the asphalt formed is that asphalt is the crudest form of naturally occurring oil. And actually, all of Los Angeles Basin, so the main part of Los Angeles, it is a basin because it uh, was underwater, geologically speaking, relatively recently. And a lot of organic material, and again, some whales and everything else, but mostly diatoms, small little plankton, all those things, eventually when they die, they settle to the bottom and uh, eventually get built up over time. Heat and pressure is what makes oil. And uh, that oil then, now that we are no longer underwater, uh, has been finding little cracks in the surface and coming up to the surface. And here's just where an area where that crudest form of oil, asphalt, as well as some of the lighter grades like methane, that like some of the bubbling that you might see here, uh, those lighter grades then come up to the surface wherever they want to. I just imagine taking a gusher and kind of squishing it. <laughs> Great, so now we're gonna take some more questions from schools across the country in the chat box. So our first question is, how do you figure out which fossil belongs to which animal, especially when you only have really small pieces? All right, so the way we tell which fossil goes to which animal or plant or insect, uh, just going by pieces sometimes, is that a lot of it is just practice and uh, just having a basic knowledge of how the different shapes work and then having practice of seeing it over and over to a certain extent. Um, say we'll take a tibia, so a shin bone. 
to a certain extent with the, most of the animals that we see, especially the large ones are mammals. And a lot of the way that we're built is the same. You'll have differences, but to a certain extent, you'll have a triangular end on the top. It'll come down to a tapered end on the bottom. It'll have a ridge right here. It's the same kind of general shapes that we learn over time. And so a lot of that is also learning the overall shape and then the differences between the different species. But again, we're very lucky in that our, the things that we find most often, because out here, I don't worry as much about the different lizard scales, mouse toes, insect like seed pods. I let them figure that out inside the laboratory when they can use um, magnifying lenses and that sort of thing. But when we're looking here, we have a more limited cast of characters. There's only a couple of dozen animals that we find most often on a large basis. If I found a mouse toe, I can just say Rodentia phalanx, and I can let them figure out what kind of mouse inside. But so a lot of it is just by learning the different shapes over time and being able to see this much of it and be like, oh, that looks kind of like a tibial tuberosity because we have practice looking at that. Pattern recognition software in our brains. So that's also why we love having volunteers that start with us in the laboratory learning what they're looking for and then come out here and help us find it. So again, we do teach them what they're looking for. We don't just expect them to know how to find things. We have one more question from Mr. Muller's class. How did this get trapped? You cut out just oh, a little bit, Captain. How do these tigers get trapped? And when do they get trapped in the tar pit? Let's make sure we heard that whole question. How do saber-toothed cats get trapped, and... And when did they get trapped? When. Thank you. Um, so saber-toothed cats get trapped in the tar pits, um, much like a lot of our other predators do. So um, in those kind of entrapment scenarios where there is a prey animal who's already stuck, who might have wandered into an asphalt seat because they didn't see it, um, those distress cries are essentially like a dinner bell for predators. So our predators are, are going to be attracted to those types of entrapment scenes because essentially what you have is prey animals who are weakened and incapacitated and can become very, very, very easy prey. Um, so our, our predators like saber-toothed cats and dire wolves, which are our two most commonly found large animals here, they are essentially attracted to these entrapment scenes because they're hungry and they're opportunistic. And uh, when, does, when do saber tooth cats get trapped? Uh, well, we find them back about 55,000 years, because that's about as old as our material has been dated, uh, through about 10, 11,000 years. So through the entire span of our collection. All right, so we have another question. This is from um, Mr. Hansen's class. And they're asking, has there been any instances of discovering viable DNA within the excavations? If so, has there been any discussion on mapping out the genome for the extinct organism? Big question there. All right, so this question is about DNA. <laughs> and uh, what's exciting is, uh, so no, we don't have any yet. I'll start with that. Um, and part of that reason that we don't have any DNA that we've yet recovered yet uh, is that asphalt is long, sticky, tricky carbon chains. And the types of material that scientists use to clean the asphalt out of the organic, the other organic material to study it, um, a lot of those chemical solvents are very harsh, and DNA is very, very delicate. Uh, so doing things like carbon-14 and getting collagen out, collagen is much sturdier. Uh, so a lot of the cleaning process they use for that just wouldn't work and haven't worked so far. But we actually have current work going on right now uh, with labs in other places in the world that are trying new ways to clean the asphalt out of the samples to try to do it very, very delicately to try to look for those DNA proteins. Um, and yes, I'm sure we would try to map it if we could get it. Um, and also, I would just love it again. I want to know if this bone goes with this bone, and wouldn't that be awesome if I could say, oh, this is dire wolf number 28957, and so is this, and try to study what happened to all of these. Uh, so we would definitely be very excited about it, but we haven't recovered it yet, and that's why. But we're still working on it, so check back later. Wonderful. This question is from Shepherd Middle School in Deerfield, Illinois. 
what is the most unique fossil that you've ever found? And also, what animal was it from? Most unique fossil. Oh, that's a tricky one. Go for it. OK, um, so this is, I don't know, maybe this is like a personal favorite of mine, but uh, one of my favorite things that we have here is uh, actually raccoons, which we think of as you know a really, really common pest. But uh, I love raccoons, personally. Um, but you know, they go through our garbage, and they're kind of annoying, because they're so smart. Um, and raccoons are actually one of the rarest fossils that we find here. I think we actually have one raccoon element in our whole collection. Um, so I mean, I think that's a pretty unique and really cool fossil that we find here, because it's something that's kind of a more common animal. But actually, for us here at La Brea, it's extremely rare. So a lot of the things that are that tend to be younger, geologically speaking, we would love more of. But again, like there's so many stories to tell, it's hard to pick just one. <laughs> but I like raccoons, so that's good. Raccoons are really cool. So. All right, our next question is: Do the volunteers come from local schools, and can young students get credit for putting in hours at the pits? Um. So a lot of our volunteers do come from local area and schools, but keep in mind, our volunteers range right now from 16 to 86, I think. So again, we have all range of volunteers, and uh, the local school getting credit thing, that would be something you'd have to work out specifically, but there is a precedent for it, uh, but it does look really good on college applications. Um, but otherwise, a lot of that, you just go through the website to find more information about that. But please help me. Okay. Another question from Secret Elementary School. Um, do you ever find evidence of insects? Um, so yes, many, many insects. We actually have, just from this box, we've been finding so many. I mean, we usually find so many, but we're finding extra many. That's a new term I just hit point. Um, in this particular box, and we have um, almost only the exoskeletons, so again, they have their skeletons on the outside, because our fossils tend to be just the hard material left over of plants and animals and insects and freshwater snails. Um, but so we find exoskeletons, but we find all different pieces of it, and occasionally, actually, with box one, one of the other boxes of this project, what we're really excited to find is layers of leaf litter uh, with articulated millipedes. So the millipedes with all the little pieces all together curled up in their little coils that died and were preserved where they lived, because again, they're detritivores, they lived in leaf litter and eating things. Um, but again, so the insects are some of our most spectacular things, and some of them still have colors that we're trying to work out and see if that is the original color, if it's influenced by the oil. Uh, but the insects are super important for studying things like climate change through time, and also how long the fossils were at the surface when they were at the surface tens of thousands of years ago. There's a lot of new papers that are coming out, especially the last few years. They're really phenomenal at studying insect chew marks on fossils and looking at you know, how long that would mean that these things would have to be at the surface. And most, if not all, of the insects are still alive today, so we can still go study them and try to make comparisons going off of our fossils. So insects are super exciting. It's not enough people will get excited about them, so come be excited about them. Great, we have two final questions for you. Um, at your excavation site. Can you say that one more time? We didn't hear that, sorry. <laughs> at your excavation site. Human, we're asking about human fossils? Yeah. Have we ever found any oh, okay. human fossils? Uh, so the question is, have we ever found any human fossils here? No, not really. We have one set of partial human remains and some grape goods, but she is from younger than we have with. So here are the tar pits. We have never, ever, ever yet, ever, ever found any evidence of ancient people and these extinct animals at the same place at the same time. It would be really exciting, and we hypothetically could. We just don't have the evidence yet. Um, and again, Box 14 specifically, where we're working right now, is between about 38 to 46,000 years old. We don't have any evidence of people in Los Angeles here at that time anyway, so I would be very surprised. I would be totally excited for it, um, but I tend to like the older things. They're, they're cooler to me. So people are awesome, but we don't have any in conjunction with these extinct animals yet that we've ever covered. 
Okay, great. So our final question is, have you ever discovered any new species undiscovered? And this is by Hudson Middle School. Uh, so new species. Well, we definitely have things that are new species for us. We continually add to that list that you're talking about of over 600 species. Um, some of the more recent things for that are we have a little type of freshwater limpet that uh, was just found on a sloth skull just a little while ago. And so that was new for us. But in general, a lot of the bigger animals you know about already, because our institution alone has been digging here for over 100 years already. Um, but mark my words, the new species that we find are going to be the little guys that up until just a few decades ago haven't really been studied very much. So again, if we find new species, my guess is that it's going to be in the insects and the freshwater snails and the plants and uh, you know, the little guys. So look for the little guys. I think they're getting their, their time coming. All right. Well, thank you all so much, Brea, for taking time to talk to us. Um, you guys were awesome. You answered all of our students' questions. There's tons more coming in, so um, we just didn't have time to answer them, but we're so glad that everyone's really excited about the field trip and um, want to ask questions to our presenters. So, And we also want to thank the two classrooms that uh, took time to ask us questions on camera. If you have any feedback for us teachers, we'd love to hear it. You can email us at novaeducation at wgbh.org. It's in the profile of this event today. We'd love to hear what you thought about the presentation. Thank you so much. We're signing out. Bye-bye. Thank you.